For some, it was StarCraft. For others, it was Civilization. For those without a gaming PC, it was Fire Emblem. And who knows? Maybe for others still, it was Halo Wars. But for me, and the rest of the guys at Team Pizza, the game that defined everything we love about the entire strategy genre was Disgaea. The series has become legendary in its own right, spawning sequels, spin-offs, a manga, etc. But hardcore fans will tell you that after a while, the main games themselves started to get ridiculous, and not in the lovable anime way either. The rules to Disgaea started getting so complicated and crazy that most maps ended up being more like giant puzzles than stat-based combat affairs. But that's in stark contrast to D2, which has offered itself up as a return to basics for the series, trying to recapture the simple magic that made the original so good. NIS is older, wiser, and more powerful than ever. So do they have what it takes to make lightning strike twice? You betcha. Okay, real talk. You should probably get comfortable, because trying to explain what Disgaea is in the span of a review is like trying to teach quantum mechanics in five minutes. So I will try my best to keep this under an hour, but I make no promises. Disgaea is the story of Laharl, the son of the late King Krzyzewskoy, and yes, that would make him the rightful successor to this throne. The throne of the Netherworld. The first game was centered around his battle for succession against the many pretenders to the throne, as well as having to deal not only with internal betrayal, but also an angel who was sent to assassinate Krzyzewskoy, only to realize he was already dead. Securing the title turned out to be the least of his problems, though, and one angel was just the beginning. A full-scale war broke out between heaven and hell, and even Earth got caught up in the mess. The sequel picks up after the resolution to that war, where it seems not everyone has yet accepted Laharl as their new leader. In fact, there's a rebel group of Krzyzewskoy loyalists aiming to replace him, and in the midst of all this, it seems another war might be just on the horizon. Oh yeah, and turns out he has a sister he was never told about. An angelic one, no less. I know I made all that sound pretty heavy-handed, but trust me, the last thing Disgaea does is take itself seriously. They aren't just planting tongue firmly in cheek, they're biting down hard to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Not only does every item, weapon, and piece of armor have a ridiculous description, not only do Laharl's own vassals openly make fun of their ruler, not only is there an entire attack devoted to a Bomberman reference, but immediately after the chapter where you defeat the rebel group and make them accept you as the overlord is a side story where Laharl gets gender swapped and goes off to fight a demonic pop star. This game does not know how to give a fuck. It doesn't even know where to get a fuck to give. But the series has always benefited from that. The dark, dreary atmosphere of the Netherworld is contrasted wonderfully by the colorful characters and the dry, sometimes absurdist humor. It gives the world a very unique charm, even if it can get a little inside baseball at times, as Japanese games are prone to do. Some of these jokes will go clean over your head if you're not an otaku or series fan by nature, but for the most part, the writing department's brain power was put into the right places. Now for gameplay. Ooh boy. Bear in mind I've only played the series up to three, so I'm not entirely sure what features are completely new. The strategy on display here is both a grid and turn-based affair, but units don't immediately attack as soon as you give the order. Instead, you can program your team to do several actions at once, one per unit. You can use this to combo your enemies and do progressively more damage, or to set up intricate plans ahead of time before you end your turn and the enemy gets to move. Your units do have classes, all with their own unique passive abilities, but they're more defined by the weapon type they carry, which they will eventually master through use and learn new skills for. Every weapon has a different reach and governing stat dictating how much damage you'll do when attacking with it, essentially setting that unit's role. Different character types also master different weapons at varying rates, so while it pays to choose a weapon that fits that class, there's nothing stopping you from doing otherwise. Monster type units can't handle humanoid weapons, but like the main characters, they gain their own set of unique skills as they go up in level. One new feature is the ability to have humanoid type units ride your monster type units, essentially turning them into a mount. While the monster will take all the damage, the humanoid unit will attack in their stead. 
That is, unless you choose to use a team attack, which combines their powers into one massive skill. These are some of the most visually impressive abilities in the game, and further, they get more powerful the longer you stick with that monster. Your team members can now develop relationships with one another, all of Fire Emblem Awakening. And not only will this provide you with extra cover attacks and protection from enemy assaults, but it will also exponentially strengthen team attacks, as well as change their dialogue when you talk to them in the castle. And yes, any unit can develop a love level relationship with any other unit. Using this system, or abusing it, I should say, you can set up character couples that would make fanfic writers sh their own internal organs. Yeah, did I mention the castle? This isn't just the place where your units hang out and you get the equipment shopping done. This place has a built-in dojo where you can train those units to gain more of a particular stat when they level up. This is also the home of the new cheat shop, where you can adjust tons of different settings for the game. Feel like you're getting more money than experience? You can change that. Want enemies to be stronger by default? You can change that. And say you want to set a personal challenge and play the game without weapon experience. Yep, they've got you covered. You can also pay a visit to the Dark Assembly, a neat little mechanic that allows you to upgrade the stock in your shops, create powerful new units, and many other things by passing bills in front of a group of demonic senators. And of course, this being the Netherworld, if the vote isn't going your way, you can just bribe them. Or beat them. Whatever works. Even if you just want a place to grind that isn't the same stages you've seen again and again, the castle has a place for that too. It's called the Item World, and it explores the mysterious space inside of your equipment. Each floor is a randomized map filled with new and strange challenges for you to conquer. By traveling further down, you even increase the power of that item, making weapons hit harder and armor more effective, so any time spent here is ultimately helpful. And then of course there's... Oh, for crying out loud, are you guys still following this? I feel like I've been talking for an eternity, and I haven't even gotten into things like geopanels, tower attacks, or the pros and cons of resurrection versus promotion. I'm an old hand at the series, but if you're coming into this green, I wouldn't blame you for feeling just a little overwhelmed by all these options. But don't let my ranting scare you off. To Disgaea's credit, it does a good job introducing you to all this one step at a time so you at least have some room to take it all in stride. But as a fan, I can also comfortably say that despite all the new stuff, the game is simpler than ever. Which I know sounds weird, but let me explain. After a while, you start to really get Disgaea, and understand why people love it so much. Notice how that level counter on the save screen has four digits. Oh yeah. Disgaea is about chasing a level ceiling that seems like it will never end. It's like the game could go on forever, and trust me, you will always have something new to do on that journey. All the new mechanics are there to service that idea and enhance it. But what I really respect is that they also committed a wonderful case of addition by subtraction, by removing the aspects that made that climb more complicated than it needed to be. Fans will notice Geo Cubes are no longer present, just as an example. D2 is a refined Disgaea, offering you more ways than ever to build the most powerful demon team in the netherworld, and have loads of fun doing so. You can even customize the color scheme and the voice pack of your units, just to give them that little extra sense of uniqueness. And if you pick the game up before November 8th, you can get a free DLC pack that puts the main three into their classic costumes. Admittedly, it's not much, but it's a nice touch. Now this is the part that's going to make fans really happy. Remember the kick-ass soundtrack the original Disgaea had? Well, in keeping with the same world, more polished mindset, most of the songs on display here are remasterings of Disgaea 1 tunes. And let me tell you, they have never sounded better. Money is typically kind to production values after all, and NIS made a lot of money off this series. They give you the option to zoom in that camera for a reason, you know. Just take a second to admire all the little details that went into these 2D sprites. And it's series tradition at this point that the battles themselves are all joyfully flashy. The animations for these abilities are so deliciously over the top, watching them play out is almost a reward in itself for all your hard work on locking them. Some of you might remember my top 10 super moves list, where I was so amazed that someone dropped the moon on the battlefield as an ability in Disgaea 3. 
that might be in need of revision now because there are multiple skills that do that in D2. I never would have thought I'd have the luxury of being picky with my celestial collisions, but here we are. And don't worry about the performances from the VO cast either. Etna's still a bitch, Flan's voice still makes you want to kill yourself, and Laharl still has the greatest laugh in the universe. The Netherworld has been brought to life in ways I never thought I'd see, and it is thoroughly enjoyable from beginning to end. For being both the first direct sequel in the series and a celebration of the original's 10th anniversary, this is a fantastic effort. I'd even go as far as to say it's the best game in the series. Yes, even trumping Disgaea 2. Wow, that's gonna get confusing. If you're already a fan, you know what you're in for, and you're gonna love every second of it. But even if you have no idea what a printy is, perhaps it's time to experience a world unlike anything you've ever seen. You'll have a hell of a time. Oh, God, did I seriously write that?